Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week in Nature, scientists published a measurement of the longest radioactive half-life of any isotope that's been so far measured directly. The isotope in question is Xenon-124 and the half-life is about 18 sextillion years, which roughly put is about a trillion times the age of the universe right now. Uh, this is a really, really cool result, but it's actually the side effect because the detector, which is under a mountain inside a giant tank of water and consists of about three and a half tons of xenon in a chamber with photosensors and a powerful electric field, that detector is actually looking for dark matter. Dark matter, as you probably know, is one of these great mysteries in astronomy. We've seen the effects of dark matter for almost a century, we've seen that the galaxy appears to rotate too quickly for the amount of visible matter there is. There is some extra gravitational force holding the galaxy together and it looks like matter. Every experiment that's looked at it has uh, confirmed that it looks like matter, that it flows. We've seen galaxies with too much of it, galaxies of too little, and yet we haven't actually seen a direct observation of it doing anything other than being gravitational. So, of course, there are lots of alter alternate theories here, let's be clear, and maybe one of these days a theory will come that will change the way gravity works and will explain the observations of dark matter, but so far most of the theories are garbage and have failed terribly. Uh, I will say that if you are looking at your know, theories of dark matter on the internet and the person claims that it also solves the Pioneer 10 anomaly, you should run away because the Pioneer 10 anomaly was solved a decade ago by completely normal things. Regardless, yeah, this detector is very, very good at looking at very long decays for xenon isotopes because it has all the xenon in there. And there's two interesting isotopes, xenon-124 and xenon-136, that both have incredibly long half-life. And the reason they have this is because the decay mechanism they use isn't simple beta decay or uh, reverse inverse beta decay, it's double beta decay and double inverse beta decay. To understand why this is, I want to give you a quick, you know, very rough crash course on nuclear physics. So for radioactive decay to occur, the nuclei have to have a difference in the binding energy. And the binding energy is what holds the nucleus together. If you imagine you had two you know, magnets and you let them slam into each other, they become bound and that releases energy. They make a noise. Similarly, if you get a nucleon, a neutron into a nucleus, that generally takes energy, right? It takes energy out of the system or whatever. And you know, you can measure this binding energy. And in fact, you can measure this binding energy because of E equals MC squared. You measure the mass of the nucleus in a mass spectrometer and you see there's actually a mass discrepancy. Helium is about 0.7% lighter than the you know, two neutrons and two protons floating around in space. That's why when you take those two neutrons, two protons and smash them together to make helium, you get energy out. It's nuclear fish, uh, fish, uh, fusion. Uh, but decays are going from one nuclear state to another and there's an energy release. And a really good example of how this might happen is beryllium-8. Now beryllium-8 is the isotope of beryllium which has the highest binding energy. It really is really well bound compared to the other isotopes. But it very neatly splits into two helium nuclei with even more binding energy on average. And that means that it has a half-life of about you know, 56 attoseconds or something ridiculous. If you try to make beryllium-8 by slamming two helium atoms together, they, they get out of there really quick. And this actually, of course, is a big problem in stellar nucleosynthesis. It slows down helium fusion and you have to do get three helium nuclei together in what's called the triple alpha process. Um, so yeah, that's one example. That's a very, very strange decay. There's also another process where the number of neutrons and the number of protons in a nucleus have to be sort of balanced. They have to uh, sit in this stable region. Neutrons and protons will stick to each other pretty well, but neutrons don't stick to neutrons and protons don't really stick to protons. 
that's a gross oversimplification, but that means that if you have a nucleus that has too many neutrons, it will try to turn some of those neutrons into protons, and if it has too few neutrons, it will try to convert some of the protons into neutrons, and it does this well, there's actually two ways this happens. If it's really sitting out on the edges, it can actually just kick out the proton or the neutron directly. That's pretty rare, but most of them will decay via beta decay or inverse beta decay. So the neutron will spit out an electron and a, an electron neutrino or an anti-neutrino and become a proton. And similarly, it's possible for a proton to accept an electron to cancel out the charge and turn into a neutron. So that's a inverse beta decay and beta decay is where you're shooting out an electron. Um, the other decay, by the way, is alpha decay and that's where you have very large nuclei. So as the nuclei get larger and larger, the nuclear forces that hold them together are very, very short range. We're talking like 10 to the minus 15 meters. And as the nuclei gets bigger and bigger, the nuclear force isn't able to cross the entire nuclei. And as the nucleus gets really big, um, the Coulomb forces, the electrostatic repulsive forces start to become more important and the nucleus starts to fall apart. Either you get spontaneous fission like you have in uh, uranium and plutonium, or it can just emit an alpha nuclei, uh, sorry, a helium nuclei, alpha particle. Helium nuclei are incredibly stable for their mass, and that's all down to magic numbers, which is not literally a word I'm making up. There's several magic numbers in nuclear stability, and two happens to be one of them. But yeah, in this case, for xenon, it would want to undergo... Um, it would want to under... Sorry, xenon-124 would want to undergo electron capture. It would want to take one of its electrons and turn one of its protons into a neutron because xenon-124 is the lightest. At the other end, xenon-136 is heavy with neutrons. It wants to undergo beta decay. The problem is, in both these cases, if you look at the isotope that would be produced, um, xenon-124 would turn into iodine-124. And the energy difference, the binding energy difference between these is very, very, very small. It's not really enough to create the virtual particles that are needed, the neutrino and uh, you know, positron and whatnot. So it doesn't make that step. It's stable. But iodine-124 can decay into tellurium-124, and it has lots of energy there. It's actually... Got enough energy to support multiple beta decays. So if, if your uh, xenon-124 could skip over the iodine and go directly to tellurium by emitting two positrons or capturing two electrons, bang, it would work. It was observationally capable. But having two of these decays happen at exactly the same time makes it very, very slow. Because if one happens and then it doesn't work and then it, it falls back to its old state. So... Iodine decay to, you know, tellurium-124 takes, I think, an order of days. And so you're trying to have these two things happen simultaneously, turns it into 10 to the 22 years. The same happens over at the other end with xenon-136. It has to go skip over the next thing and it takes a lot longer. So that is the longest directly observed half-life. However, we know of longer half-lives because you can actually look at materials in nature and you can look at the decay pathways and the isotope ratios and you can actually get an idea of some of these really long half-lives. And the candidate for the longest nuclear half-life that we've seen is probably tellurium-128, which undergoes double beta decay, it emits two electrons, and it does. And that means it decays into xenon-128, and it does so with a half-life of about 10 to the 24 years, 100 times longer than this latest result. Now, these are all beta decays. They use the weak process. The longest uh, alpha decay process that's known so far is bismuth-209, which was actually thought to be stable up until 2003 when it was observed decaying, the half-life on that is about 10 to the 19 years. So again, you know, a lot longer than the age of the universe, but uh, it's uh, not nearly as long as these other candidates. Gamma radiation. Now, that's a you know, atoms can undergo gamma radiation, gamma decay. There, that's a completely different process. 
So all these decay processes I've talked about have been transformative. They've changed the nucleus into one form or another. Gamma decay occurs in a nucleus where it goes from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. So you probably think about the nucleus as being at the core, this kind of solid thing at the center of the atom. Actually, you've got to think more of a cloud of you know, protons and neutrons zipping around, oscillating around. Just like electrons bouncing around the outside of the nucleus being held in place by the electric field, the nucleons are also doing this. They're in these energetic states and they're bouncing around, so to speak. And it's possible to knock these into slightly higher energy states and then when they fall back down, they release gamma rays. Now, the way a nucleus typically gets knocked into one of these high energy states is it undergoes radioactive decay from one element into another, and that leaves the nucleus behind with an excess of energy, which it then gets rid of by emitting gamma rays. A great example of this is cobalt-60, which decays into nickel-60, and after it does that, the nucleus is in a high energy state, and it emits a couple of gamma ray photons, which is why cobalt-60 is used as a gamma ray emitter. Most gamma emission happens really, really fast. We're talking about 10 to the minus 12 seconds. But there's a few cases where it takes a lot longer, and these are called metastable atoms. So when you knock one of these nucleons up into a higher energy state, it can change the angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum inside the nucleus. And that means that when the thing decays to the lower energy state, it has to get rid of this angular momentum and reach the ground state angular momentum. And that means the photon has to carry it. But the photon normally only inherits one unit of angular momentum. There are other ways to give it more, but these decay methods mechanisms are slower. So when you have an excited atom with extra orbital angular momentum, it slows down the gamma decay. It also actually slows down the beta decay because the beta decay also has to kind of conserve this angular momentum. And there's one really pathological case. It's called tantalum 180m. And in this case, the excited state has to get rid of eight units of angular momentum. So for every extra unit of angular momentum you have to get rid of, it suppresses the decay rate by about a factor of 10 to the power of 5, 100,000. So getting rid of all that really slows down the decay process. And in fact, we know that it shouldn't be stable, but no one has ever observed tantalum 180m decaying. Uh, so this actually makes it the rarest primordial isotope. For extra bonus points, scientists haven't actually figured out how to make it in a lab. They have figured out that you can cause it to decay by hitting it with gamma rays, but they haven't figured out how to actually make it get into that state in the first place. Tantalum 180m is also a really fascinating oddball because it has an odd number of protons and an odd number of electrons. The atomic number of tantalum is 73, and so it has 73 protons, it has 107 neutrons in this case, and normally when it isn't in this excited state, it actually decays in a few hours. Uh, atoms or isotopes with odd numbers of protons and odd numbers of neutrons are a lot less stable. It turns out that protons really want to pair up and so neutrons want to pair up and that makes them more stable. The most stable nuclei all have even numbers of protons and even numbers of neutrons. In fact, there are only four isotopes of uh, with four isotopes where they have odd numbers of protons and neutrons which are stable in their ground state. There's deuterium, there's lithium-6, there's boron-10, and there is uh, nitrogen, which has 14, you know, has a mass of 14, seven protons, seven neutrons. And everything else above that is unstable, except for this oddball, where you kick it into a higher energy state and the nucleus is spinning or oscillating faster and contains more energy. That, for some reason, makes it too fast to die. And that's the longest-lived gamma uh, process. And in fact, yeah, it's possibly the rarest primordial element, rarest primordial isotope. 
So yeah, coming back to this original experiment with these long-lived xenon isotopes, they're also interesting because they can examine a particular theory, a particular conjecture in particle physics, where uh, there's a suggestion that neutrinos might in fact be their own antiparticles, so that if neutrinos collide, they would annihilate each other. And this can actually be tested when you have a double beta decay or a double inverse beta decay, because of course they're supposed to spit out two neutrinos. Now, if those would annihilate each other, it would change the energy spectrum. And they've been looking for this for a while to see if there's anything more to the standard model to confirm whether neutrinos are, in fact, their own uh, antiparticles. So far, there's been no evidence of this, but it's not necessarily expected to be a particularly common process, and the experiments are getting bigger all the time. So again, they're looking for dark matter, but they're also probing other parts of the models of physics and you know pushing out the limits on various corners of reality, let's say. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I certainly love talking about this stuff. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.